In the early 60s, the main things in our lives and on TV all the time were the Beatles, President Kennedy was the, the president of the States. And that, that was all we got. There were no troubles. And literally a decade later, the 70s were unbelievably horrific. There are two communities here, and the majority of Protestant people are Unionist and want to retain the link with the United Kingdom. Most Catholics are either Nationalist or Republican. They want a united Ireland either by peaceful means if they're Nationalist or Republican. IRA had a tradition of violence going way back. Well, Northern Ireland in those dark days was a very different place. The Troubles had a huge impact on your way of life. People in my generation knew nothing but the Troubles, so um, you know we didn't know a time before that. There was a lot of soldiers in the street. Um, there was effectively a ring of steel that was put around this uh, town when I was growing up. So my grandfather was shot by paramilitaries. He was shot in his home with his kids and his wife. They were all present, there was a baby. My granddad was only in his early 20s whenever he was shot and his life was really well and truly imploded from that point on. You know, he was a history teacher, he now couldn't go to work. My mum and dad would have preferred going shopping, for example, in Dundalk, in County Louth, just down the road in the Republic of Ireland, because it felt safer than going to Neary. I was lucky to survive a church bomb in 1973. It was a 600-pound bomb left outside in the car park with no warning. Um, I remember my mum telling me when she was very small having to jump into the bushes because there was sniper fire. The postman was actually shot through the neck and nearly in front of them. My grandfather was a prison guard and constantly had to check under his car and, and go to work in that sense. Three mortar bombs went off, hitting the barracks, which is a few doors down. Parts of the roof started falling in on top of us. We were 10 years of age. Couldn't have cars parking anywhere, you know, where there's a lot of commercial. So the centre of Belfast, for example, became a known drive zone. We grew up um, where there was shootings and bombings every other week, and then the opportunity to sign this agreement that would actually stop it all for good was huge. The 1994 ceasefires stopped the violence and then four years later uh, the Good Friday Agreement cemented the first real attempt to, to have two communities working together. I went to the Mitchell Institute and Senator Mitchell would come often to speak to students and he often said that the Good Friday Agreement wasn't a static document, it's, it's a constant thing that moves forward. It was a huge breakthrough because for so long it looked as if it was possible, it was on the horizon, but would we ever get there? It was an amazing day, it really was. It was full of hope and inspiration, so it was great. I mean, the Good Friday Agreement is sort of like, it's a framework for all of us and for our young people to turn it, to take it forward. Working in the Republic of Ireland and, and living in Northern Ireland, to be honest, is quite a common occurrence for a lot of people around here. The majority of people in this town actually work in the south of Ireland. Barriers that you would have seen years ago have all gone. As you can see there's absolutely nothing here. Um, the borders have all been removed. Uh, there's no infrastructure at all. So as you go from Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland the only difference you see is the change in signage. Young people are certainly starting to recognise the benefits of being here in Belfast and, and in Northern Ireland. I'm a father of a three and a half year old and I would say for my daughter, you know, the Good Friday Agreement has given Northern Ireland and by extension her an opportunity to, to reach her life goals, her career ambitions. Been very fortunate to welcome some people back to Belfast that haven't been here over the past few decades. And they walk around here and they talk about a, 
reimagined Belfast. The impact on tourism has been phenomenal because I see people who are what we would call repeat guests, repeat visitors to Ireland. If you just told someone in Belfast 30 years ago there's going to be 130 cruise ships coming to Belfast to see our, the, our, our countryside and visit Belfast, they'd have laughed at you. They would have thought you were crazy, you know? <laughs> Even for the example, we've had the Game of Thrones series has created over £215 million to the Northern Ireland economy. So that gives you some idea of where we've come. We didn't have tourism during the Troubles. You know, would you go to Beirut or Belfast? You know, it was, it was that dark. In the last 10 years, you can really see a turnaround in the hotels and restaurants, facilities like Titanic, the Giants Causeways Visitor Centre, 18 brand new hotels in Belfast. Who thought you'd ever saw the day? I remember the excitement um, from family uh, and friends, relatives, uh, when it was signed. It was euphoric. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I only really became aware of the term Peace Baby uh, probably last year, uh, but it has been something that has defined my life since I was born. I was adopted from Kenya and came here as a baby and know nothing but peace. I, I didn't know that I was living in a post-conflict sort of society that was marred by such violence. Living and working here in Belfast means that um, I hear so many stories of what life was like pre the agreement. It was always kind of something you were aware of, like you would see the flags going around and you know there were comments people would make but it was never a big kind of part of my life. I think the fact that I was um, in my late teens before I realised the significance of the Good Friday Agreement is a very good thing. You know some of my friends are from Catholic backgrounds, some of my friends are from Protestant backgrounds, it's never a thing that's caused an issue for us. I think a lot of young people now their focus is on things like poverty, mental health, homelessness because I don't see the point in tackling the big massive, you know, where, where we're a part of issue without actually looking after the people in the country that we're living. You know, it's 25 years. I'm soon turning 25. I keep thinking about the next 25, even the next one. Like, what is Stormont going to look like in, in a year from now? Do, am I worried about Northern Ireland post-Brexit? Yes. Whenever that vote happened back in 2016, I couldn't help but feel a little bit ignored in Northern Ireland because I did feel like Northern Ireland had been dragged out. I think Brexit for me has been the biggest jolt to the post process since the time of the ceasefires. We need to be very careful around how leaving the European Union will impact on communities. So we've spent an awful long time trying to change the narrative of negative language that keeps people from visiting here. And it's all resurfaced again in terms of Brexit. Brexit, quite frankly, has jeopardised the Good Friday Agreement. That, that piece, that hard-won piece, that took 30 years. A lot of our charities, organisations and community groups are funded by the European Social Fund. And now that that's all being pulled away, so many people are being made redundant or being put on notice. I have benefited a lot from especially funding from peace funding from the EU because they would fund uh, some of our work in here and stuff like that. And obviously they funded so much you see the way the way flag on so many things in Northern Ireland. People are really worried around issues such as health, education, cost of living, but we don't have a functioning government. We don't have an assembly sitting at the minute. And the root cause of the fact that we don't have an assembly sitting is the fact that we voted to leave the European Union. question is what are your hopes for Northern Ireland for the next 25 years? I just hope that we continue to make progress in creating um, a fair, safe a place for people to live, that people want to live here, that they're proud to be from here. I really, really hope that we get an opportunity to carve out our own future for the next generation to come. The generation that come after me continue to know less and less about the trauma that you know, my parents and my grandparents would have grown up with. I would like to see Belfast become a massive hub or an attraction, a place to come and visit. 
the next 25 years in Northern Ireland, I hope that there is much more integrated education. I hope that that is the norm. I hope that we continue in Northern Ireland and continue on this path of peace. I would also hope that the Good Friday Agreement gets built upon. We haven't got places like the Giant's Causeway, Dunluce Castle. Those are all the key elements, so preserving all of those things is essential for our future, yeah. You know, we're working holistically to sell this place for people to come and enjoy, you know, so, so it's all about us, the people. There's a great Irish saying, innate go curl like curly, there is no strength without unity. It's, it's, it feels like it's finally time for us to kind of come into our own and reach the full potential. You know, places like London and Edinburgh already had that, but we never really fully got it before. Look to the Titanic story um, over a hundred years ago. It was this small little industrial city, but it was driven by big ambition. But now, a hundred years on from whenever Titanic and her sister ship set sail from here in Belfast, that same hope ambition for prosperity that is now accumulating for the next 100 years ahead. Pablo, it's absolutely amazing because I get the chance to showcase my city. My little bit can do one bit to come and see not only how lovely the countryside, the cities are, but how lovely and welcome the people are. I love Northern Ireland today. It's my home for a start, but um, there are so many wonderful things here that people don't immediately think of and that's that's frustrating because we have such incredible landscapes you know we look at the Moor Mountains everybody knows about the Giant's Causeway as well. I work and breathe and live in the Giant's Causeway I'm a guide there. What I want to do there is keep alive that rich cultural heritage and history. Game of Thrones came and filmed the pilot back in 2009-2010. Uh, I ended up being uh, selected as a stand-in body double for Hodor so uh, not only Hodor but also the mountain you know and that has actually then sort of gives me title you could say to be able to do tours but it's really the, the visitors that have come on the back of that it's the tourism side that's now ongoing you put that aside we've now got um, the Belfast Harbour Studios as well as those original Titanic studios uh, Netflix are here almost constantly I'm really proud to live in a country that has overcame and can come out the other side of that and say Look, there's a future here. The people in Northern Ireland are so incredibly warm. We have the best sense of humour that I've certainly ever come across. You, know, you come here because of us, the people as well, our, our branding, you know, Northern Ireland Tourist Board branding, embrace a giant spirit. I'm always up for a hug, you know. <laughs> uh, the people are, make it. I mean, we have all the beautiful attractions, but without the people, you know, it would be nothing. I think it's our instinct to host people, to make them laugh, to make them feel comfortable, to have the crack. And what's your favourite thing about Northern Ireland? It's people. Yeah. Without a doubt. Fabulous. Fabulous, fabulous race of people. Overcome, endure, come back together, see a future, see down the road together. It's people. Fantastic race of people.